morning to the St. John's Diaspora at home this morning. Uh, we are doing our first ever Facebook Live uh, worship service, 1030 this Sunday morning, the third Sunday of Lent. A couple of notes before we begin. First of all, uh, if you have a prayer book at home, we will begin as we uh, normally do in Lent on page 319 in the Book of Common Prayer with the penitential rite of the Holy Eucharist, Rite 1. So you can look that up in your prayer book. If you don't have a prayer book, um, you can just let the liturgy carry you along this morning. Also, to those who are on our email list, the readings were sent out last night. So if you pull that up on uh, your computer or print them off, you will have uh, the readings to follow along as we go through the ministry of the liturgy of the word uh, this morning. A couple of other announcements. Um, first of all, please let us know you're here. Um, believe it or not, the diocese has asked us to uh, keep attendance records this morning of those who are worshiping remotely with us. So if you could um, either like or better yet, if you have a few people uh, watching on one account, um, make a comment in the comment section. Just let us know how many you have in your household who are watching and we'll do our best to keep those records. Um, also want to point out that um, the vestry has been calling around the parish. We do want to make sure that our people are well. Uh, we're willing to bring communion or come out to prayer to those who need it. So we have been checking around. Uh, if you have not received a phone call, we want to make sure we have the right information, the correct phone number. Some of our new folks, we don't have much contact information at all. So um, email me, Hauk, St. John's Episcopal.org, um, if you haven't heard from your best member, or uh, if you'd like some pastoral care during this time where we're all laying low. Um, lastly, if you want to receive our emails, if you are uh, joining us for worship and not on the St. John's uh, email list, uh, email me and we'll make sure you get uh, signed up for that as well. Good to have you with us this morning. We're going to begin on page 319. Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. His mercy endureth forever. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, who seest that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever.
A reading from the book of Exodus. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people found fault with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you find fault with me? Why do you put the Lord to the proof? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the rod with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the fault finding of the children of Israel and because they put the Lord to the proof by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him 
will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came. They marveled that he was speaking with a woman, but none said, What do you wish, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples besought him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him food? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes and see how the fields are already white for harvest. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of your words that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that was a doozy. It's rare that we uh, get a gospel quite so long as we have today. There's a lot in it. And also, I would say with uh, John's gospel, there's also all these different levels of meaning that's going on. You know, last week we had Nicodemus coming to Jesus about... Um, who he is and Jesus telling him he must be born anew or born again and uh, Nicodemus taking literally everything Jesus was saying as he redirected him Nicodemus saying must I go back into my mother's womb but of course Jesus is talking about spiritual realities there even though Nicodemus isn't catching on and the same thing is true here with the woman of Samaria he's talking about living water Uh, And actually, even in that day, living water wasn't uh, a phrase that she would have uh, at first taken as something mystical or symbolic. 
The term living water in Jesus' day just meant uh, running water or like river water as opposed to stagnant water. But Jesus is actually speaking in this uh, more in-depth way about a water that gives life. He's taking it below the level of the literal, talking about this deeper thirst, this deeper need, this uh, deeper hunger that human beings have. And I think that's probably true of you. You understand this. We all try to fill uh, this thirst, this hunger with food and drink and bread and circus, entertainment and excitement. And then we say after all of that, is that all there is? And it's actually just that question that uh, drove a person like C.S. Lewis to faith. Uh, this longing, this unsatisfied longing, this pang for something more. Why do we all want something more? You know, we thirst because our bodies need water. We hunger because our bodies need food. We long for more, always, because God has made us for himself. And we're restless and thirsty until we finally rest in him and have a good drink. I think that's the theological point of this passage, along with how Jesus is the one who gives the living water. He is the one who is speaking to our heart. He is the one who is filling our longings for belonging and purpose. And he is the one, the ultimate one, who can give us what we really need, even after a meal, even after our third glass of wine. He is the one with the deeper water that we all need. But then in this passage, we have all these characters, right? And what I often do in my private reading of Scripture, especially when it comes to a passage in the Gospel, uh, is to read it with this question in mind, who am I in the story? Who do I relate to? Who do I resemble? Who looks a lot like me? So let's uh, consider the characters in the time that we have left. First, there's the woman at the well. You might say that she's the, uh, the consummate outsider. She's a Samaritan, strike one, right? We heard in the passage that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Uh, the word Samaritan alone in this uh, reading to those who first heard it would, would already indicate some kind of scandal. Uh, she is an outcast. She is a person that a good Jew would not be interacting with in the first place. Number two, she's a woman. Strike two. <laughs> Rabbis in the first, in the first century um, didn't interact with women. You know, theology, talking about God, what the commandments mean, that is stuff that men did. No self-respecting rabbi would be talking to a woman in the first century. So then, also, she's a woman with, uh, how to say it, kind of a rotten report card in life when it comes to relationships. One of the commentaries that I read pointed out that almost nobody came to the well at midday. People came to draw water in the cool of the morning or at the close of day. But here it comes in what our passage calls the sixth hour, which would have been what we call high noon. She's probably coming because she's uh, avoiding people, right? Those who have judged her, gossiped about her, shunned her. So strike three. <laughs> According to all the standards that characterize a good person in first century Judaism, she is not and maybe that's something you can relate to. Maybe you yourself don't have a perfect record. Or maybe you have felt misunderstood at best, or judged at worst. I'll never forget a woman who came into uh, St. Matthias, the church I was at before St. John, years ago. She came in because she said she needed gas for her car, and I told her I would meet her up at the corner of Exxon in order to fill up her tank. And while she was there, and 
I was loading her car with gas. I said, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? Do you have a church? Do you have people around you who can love you and support you? And I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, you know, I have made so many mistakes in my life. I would have to do a lot of work before I ever went back to church. My word at the time was, I think you got Jesus uh, all wrong. You know, we don't need to clean ourselves up and then go to Jesus. We go to him and we let him uh, clean us up. Or maybe in, uh, in terms of this story, we don't need to hydrate ourselves with our good works before we uh, make our appearance known to the Lord who loves us. We just go as we are. Of course, maybe what she was more nervous about was not running into the Lord at church, but into uh, all the people at church who might judge her or ridicule her or have preconceived ideas about her when she walked into the door. And that's the second crowd that you might relate to today. Maybe you relate to the good people in the story. Here, I think, embodied in Jesus' disciples. Here's what it says in the passage to remind you. Just then his disciples came. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But none said, what do you wish? Or why are you talking with her? You know, I think a word that could be better translated from marvel was they were amazed. They were scandalized. Uh, they're probably saying to themselves, what is he doing? You know, what if word gets around? What about the reputation of our rabbi hanging out with all the wrong people? Christian people, I think, have a really hard time finding that line between righteousness and self-righteousness. Yes, you know, Jesus calls us to goodness and integrity and uprightness of life and truth and honesty and sacrifice and service. And at the same time, Jesus is always calling his disciples to mercy and grace and compassion. The way I uh, have come to describe it is that every person that you meet is about 100 yards up from the car wreck. I actually based this on uh, a friend of mine who crashed his car close to home and then had to walk about a length of a football field to get to his house. And he did it in a state of shock and encountered people on the way, neighbors who thought he was being rude because he wasn't answering. Or maybe people who thought he was just weird were crazy and not responding to their questions. But of course he was getting over a kind of trauma, right? Everybody you meet is getting over something. We all have hurts and disappointments and things we've suffered, whether our fault or somebody else's fault. Everybody is trying in some way to just get on their life, get on with their life and to cope the best way they know how, and you have no idea what somebody else might be dealing with. So the disciples come to the scene without a care about why this woman might be who she is or where she is on her journey in life. Why couldn't she make her multiple marriages work? Whose fault was it? The text doesn't say, but we always want to know. I mean, especially those who are self righteous need to know whose fault was it who's the person to blame but i would suggest if you can realize that everyone you meet is really just a hundred yards up from the car wreck then those other aspects of righteousness that jesus is always talking about mercy and grace and compassion can actually make you available to people in a way that the disciples, when they meet this woman at the well, were not available to her because they were good people. Then in terms of characters, there's uh, Jesus. He's available. He's curious. He's inquisitive. Why are you so thirsty, lady? <laughs> I think a fascinating piece of the story is that he asks her for a drink. 
I mean, how unkosher is that? A Samaritan, a woman, an imperfect person, she's going to serve the Son of God? But Jesus doesn't care about any of that. He's not going to catch anything from her. She's not going to ruin his reputation or make him unclean. She is just another human being a hundred yards up from the car wreck who needs to be loved and who also has love to offer. Can you give me a drink, he says. He's just wanting to meet her where she is. And then the story proceeds without a hint of judgment. He puts his finger on, you know, the more tender parts of her story, patiently trying to lead her to a well that is so deep and so full that she can satisfy this incredible thirst that she has. And that well, of course, is the unconditional love that Jesus has for her. So who are you in the story? As for me, I see myself in the Samaritan woman. My record's not perfect. I don't know if I qualify as a good person, even by my own standards. At the same time, I see myself in the disciples, with all the stupid judgments and categorizing of people that I've been party to, being political, sometimes cowardly in whom I choose to not stick up for. And I also see a little bit of Jesus in myself. And more and more, I want to see more of him in myself and offer the kind of love that he offers this woman. And I guess the only way to offer that love is to drink down a long tall glass of the love that Christ offers me, imperfect as I am, good in the wrong sense of the term, that he meets me where I am, wanting to quench my thirst, so that then maybe I can be a thirst quencher for others as God gives me the opportunity throughout the days of my life. Who are you in the story? Which character are you? Which character do you want to be like? Spend some time in that as you uh, pray throughout the day, as you pray before bedtime. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and then take in a long, tall drink of the love Christ has for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
form of the prayers of the people that we use on Sunday morning in the season of Lent is form two on page 385 in the Book of Common Prayer. There is a space in this form of the prayers for you to offer your own intercessions, either silently or aloud, which I encourage you to do this day. Let us pray for the church and the world. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. Ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for the mission and ministry of the Diocese of Dallas, for George and Michael, our bishops. I ask your prayers for the Church of Our Savior, Suez, our sister congregation in Egypt, for Ehab, their priest, and for all the congregation. I ask you your prayers for the outreach of our parish, for St. John's Episcopal School, the Austin Street Center, the White Rock Center of Hope, Gateway of Grace, the Genesis Women's Shelter, the Kellerman's Mission in Uganda, the Kairos Prison Ministry, Reinhardt Elementary School. Pray for the ministries of our church. Ask your prayers for those who are celebrating birthdays today. For those who are expecting children, especially Catherine, Sheridan, and Katie. For those who are traveling, and for all in the St. John's community. Pray for our parish. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. I'm going to add a couple of uh, prayers from the prayer book at this point. First, going to pray for uh, those who are ill. It's the uh, prayer on page 458 in the ministration to the sick. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, we humbly beseech thee to behold, visit, and relieve all thy servants who are sick, for whom our prayers are desired. Look upon them with the eyes of thy mercy. Comfort them with a sense of thy goodness. Preserve them from the temptations of the enemy. Give them patience under their affliction. In thy good time, restore them to health and enable them to lead the residue of their lives in thy faith and fear and to thy glory. And grant that finally they may dwell with thee in life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
And now the prayer for the clergy and people on page 817. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for this honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before the uh, solemn prayer, which will conclude our service, I want to uh, remind you to please um, sign in if you are viewing online, even if it's already posted and you are uh, viewing the service, let us know that you were here so we can mark attendance as well as we can. Again, please feel free to email me at hauk at St. John's Episcopal Church dot org. I'm sorry, St. John's Episcopal dot org. If I or the church can minister to you in any uh, way during this season that our worship is closed and um, wash your hands and take care of yourself and hug your loved ones and say your prayers. Here's the blessing prayer for the third Sunday of Lent. Look mercifully on this, your family, almighty God, that by your great goodness, they may be governed and preserved forevermore through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.